This conference will now be recorded. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that every scripture is inspired by you and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, just as you say in 2 Timothy 3.16. Lord, as the world is constantly changing and devolving, we need more Christians who are equipped in the Word of God who can share the truth of the Bible in a loving way. So we pray for more workers in the harvest as this world polarizes. In Matthew 9, 37 and 38, your scripture says that Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Lord, we pray for the protection of your children who are speaking the truth in love. All of us who are your children, for your protection, wisdom, guidance, and understanding of what your Holy Spirit wants to accomplish in and through us. May everything we say and do as examples of our Lord Jesus honor and glorify you and your kingdom. Lord, we lift up all of our prayer requests that we have discussed earlier. Father, you know each and every one, and we know that you are greater than each and every challenge that we face. Father, for healing, for salvation, for late guidance, leading and direction in our lives, for a hedge of protection around us and your hand of healing. We pray in the resurrection power of the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. Amen. Amen. And welcome back, Aunt Joyce. We're so happy to see you back. And we're glad you're feeling well enough to sit in our class tonight. We've been praying for you. Yeah, we just we just we, talked about you about three right. minutes ago. And we're wondering how you were doing. So why don't you tell us real quick how you were doing? I'm doing much better. Thank you. The doctor's giving me lots of medicine to try to keep me awake. So hope I can get through the class without falling asleep. <laughs> Thanks. I well, you do whatever is comfortable for you. We're just delighted that you've joined us tonight. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank I just want to mention, you. too, uh, before we get into the study, Sylvia and I attended First Baptist Church of Myrtle Beach on Sunday. Yay. Uh, the preacher was, uh, he preached right from Exodus. He preached about Moses and 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 the um, uh, about what kind of a mother he had and what it meant to him and to history. And I'm sure they recorded it if you want to hear a really terrific sermon um, on Moses and his mother uh, for Mother's Day. Uh, and also I thought was really interesting. Uh, uh, this pastor, when he prays, he, 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 kneels. He, he kneels down on a knee when he's praying to uh, for everybody and right up there on the altar. just uh, and preach the truth. So we were very happy to be there and to experience that. Uh, if you're following along in this Bible study, uh, we are going to be in uh, Psalm chapter 18. Um, <clears throat> I'll just mention up front that I believe that some of the versions of the Bible have numbered uh, these 51 verses perhaps a little differently than one another. So uh, uh, when I make a reference to verse one, two, three, whatever the number is, uh, we'll just make sure that we're all on the same verse together. Because I think I used. Um, the tree of life version, which comes from the Hebrew background. And sometimes the Hebrew background has a little bit different numbering system than let's say a different version of the Bible. All right, uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, calls this particular Psalm the great, uh, the grateful perspective. This is where David is writing uh, towards the end of his life. He's being quite reflective about what has taken place in his life and how God has worked in his life 
And this is very much human nature. The older that we become, uh, the more reflective we tend to be. We realize that we have more days behind us than we have in front of us in this particular life. And no doubt, this is one of the reasons why um, we find a lot of elderly in our culture uh, have issues with depression. Um, and we tend to think back and realize of some of the lost opportunities or some of the poor mistakes that we made. And that is not what this psalm is about, but rather David is looking back over his life uh, and he's reflecting how faithful God was to him in his life. David is reminiscing about at every turn, God was proving himself to be faithful. Uh, one of the remarkable qualities about the life of David was how many enemies he had. Oh my gosh. It's 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 right. fascinating that every every enemy uh, that he had that God delivered him, um, and uh, God provided uh, an escape for David. And you might find a subtitle in your translation that says, "The day that the Lord delivered David from all of the hands of his enemies." or maybe the day that the Lord delivered David from the hands of all of his enemies. So even though David had an abundance of enemies throughout his life, uh, if you've studied history uh, in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, you're gonna find that Psalm 18, not necessarily verbatim, not word for word, but the majority of Psalm 18 is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 22. And so this must be an important thing for us to that God wants us to learn when he repeats things, as uh, Arnie eloquently spoke about last week. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, not word for word, but uh, nearly identical. And the value of this Psalm is that here we have a very godly man in David, and he's telling us how he weathered the storms, the storms of life, and how God was able to deliver him uh, from all of these storms. Welcome, Carrie Crawford from uh, Maryland. Glad you're here. Hi, Carrie. And uh, we're going to start with Howard. Howard, would you read the first two verses in Psalm 18? I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my strength. Uh, hang on a second. I think, yeah, you see, all right, that's good. Uh, that's verse three in my reference here. All right, so thank you for reading that. Um, I knew we were going to have a problem <laughs> with the numbering system, but uh, thank you for reading that. Uh, just remember, we're on verse one, two, three now. So like many of the Psalms, the actions which uh, David is taking here is not based upon his emotions, but rather notice David says, I will, uh, his, his will is involved here. He's doing that which is right and righteous. Uh, his will is to love the Lord God. It does not matter how David feels about things, uh, uh, but rather it's all about him loving God and making the right kind of choices. You and I have the ability to choose what our reaction is in those things of life uh, that come our way. We will find that many of the things that we cannot control uh, um, that come our way in our lives, we can still choose how we respond to those things. Uh, and when you're thrown certain curves, uh, certain challenges in life, uh, 
maybe an unpleasant example might be, let's say, having a child that might have had a, defect, a birth defect or some kind of an illness. You didn't choose that child to have an illness, but now it's part of your life. And how are you going to deal with it? What kind of choices are you going to make to respond to what is so? David had all of these enemies chasing after him. He didn't choose that, but they were chasing after him. And so David's response here, he is choosing to serve. He's choosing to love God. Uh, and, and then um, the remainder of these 50, 51 verses in Psalm 18 uh, is going to tell us what does that look like? What does it look like? How does it show up in your life when you say God is my first priority in my life? I choose to love God with all my heart. What does that look like? Well, it starts out with verse three, which, which uh, Howard read, God or Adonai is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. Uh, in him I take refuge, uh, my shield, uh, my horn of salvation, and my stronghold. So David calls God seven titles here in this verse. Um, and uh, he is saying that it is absolutely impossible for God to fail David. Notice all of the personal pronouns that David's using here with every title. This is a personal pronoun. This is, a, uh, this is not something that David uh, picked up as titles that he, he learned about in the Wall Street Journal or anything like that, right? This is, uh, this is not something that he read about in, in Hebraic theology, but rather, these are things where David has experienced this personally. He did not read about God being his high tower. He did not read about God being his fortress, but rather David has lived these experiences so that he has firsthand knowledge of uh, these titles. So we can see uh, David having uh, confidence which, which appears to be unconquerable. David has absolute confidence in God. It doesn't matter what happens in David's life, nor uh, who is chasing him down, or how many people are chasing him down and trying to kill him. David has the confidence in God that God can deliver him from any enemy that he is facing. So for any of us to say we love God, uh, we're being taught here by David that, there, that, that uh, love for God will manifest itself in having total confidence in God. All right, so um, Fran, would you read the next verse and just, uh, I'm guessing that's going to be verse three in your in your version. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. All right. So go ahead and read that. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And I am saved from my enemies. All right, so notice here that David believed that God was worthy of praise. Listen carefully. God was worthy of praise before David was delivered. You know, this is not like uh, the little kids waking up early on Christmas morning and running down to the Christmas tree and they open up 15 or 20 presents uh, while the parents look on. And, and you know, there's, there's, there's gift uh, paper flying everywhere and and everything that this child could possibly want was found in those gift boxes. And then the kid goes over to mom and dad and says, boy, you're just the greatest. This is not what's going on here. That's praising after the fact. David is praising 
God before God delivered David. You see, uh, where 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 it says, and so I shall be saved. Some of your Bibles say I will. Well, I was rescued, or I shall be rescued. Uh, the the uh, if you go back to the original Hebrew grammar, it's future tense. David is praising God not because he was saved, not because he has been delivered, not because he has everything that he wants, but rather David is praising God because God is worthy of praise. So who is who? Uh, he is praising God because who 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 God is, and what God is dictates that you and I to praise praise him it doesn't matter if god does uh everything and anything that you want and it doesn't matter where god where, where god doesn't do anything that you want it doesn't change the fact that god is worthy and that god should be praised and so therefore we have an obligation praise god we tend to praise God for those things which he has done for us. David suggests here that is secondary. It doesn't matter if God blessed you with a great job or that he blessed you with great wealth or he blessed you with great health or healing. It doesn't matter. All of those things are praiseworthy. But for David, the primary reason for praising God is because of who God is, David will praise God and David knows that God will deliver him. All right, uh, Arne and Helen, would you read the next uh, one, two, the next three verses, starting with chords of death? I think that might be four, five, six. The chords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The chords of shoal entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Yeah, so that word cry or cried uh, used here has the meaning of shrieking. It has the meaning of screaming. Uh, this is the kind of terminology that someone would use. Let's say, God forbid, you were swimming out at the beach, you went out a little too far, and there becomes an undercurrent, and it's pulling you under, and you're, you've gone down a couple times, and now you're going, getting ready to go down for the third time, and you scream your head off to try to find somebody to come out and rescue. It's that kind of an idea that... Uh, that David is screaming. David is not saying prayers here, but rather he's screaming his head off for God to help him. He's crying out to God because of all of the affliction around him. Uh, Nancy, would you unmute and read, uh, uh, I guess it's seven. Uh, read maybe three or four verses, and then we'll have uh, Joyce read read some there right okay. after you. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. Okay, Joyce. All right, thanks. Yeah, Joyce, would you continue for a few more verses? He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones, coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones, coals of fire. And he Thank sent you. Out I'm the okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Carrie, would you unmute and read the next few verses? Yay. He sent out his arrows and scattered them 
and he shot out lightnings and dis discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils, he sent from above, he sent me, he drew me out of, the, of many waters. Thank you. So now that she starts out with the word then, uh, when, when is then? This would be after David cried out, after David screamed for help, he prayed and screamed to God, then God moved. Prayers activate the throne of God. If you get a sense in your life that there's not a great deal of spiritual stuff going on in your life, you might want to check a little bit on how your prayer life is going. Are you calling out to God? Are you, are you asking God? Are you screaming out to God? Are you praying to God? Uh, you might want to examine your prayer activity and see how much time you're spending praying to the throne of God. If you do not have a lot of activity showing up in your life, if you don't have a lot of intervention going on in your life from God, you might want to pray a little more. This might be why the Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. You know, we as human beings have a, a tendency to view God as, as grandpa, a grandpa figure, a nice jolly old guy who wants to have a jolly old time. Uh, but, but we don't see any grandpa going on in here in these verses, but rather we see an intense God who is able to deal with whatever we are facing in our life. It's a, in, a, in a very intense way. All right, who's got a comment or question on the first 16 verses? Sylvia, go ahead. Okay, so David calls God seven different titles. You know, I love the names of God because that's the way he wants to relate to us. If I need healing, I call on Jehovah Rapha. If I need peace, I call on Jehovah Shalom. If I need provision, I call on Jehovah Yireh. I can go on and on. There are a hundred plus different names of God, and David calls on seven of them, uh, and and it's personal to him. It's based on his relationship and experience with him, with God, and it's based on God's character. Uh, his firsthand knowledge of God's character. So he's calling him Adonai, which means the Lord. He's calling him Savior because he's the one who rescues him. He calls him a high tower uh, from which he can hide from his enemies, a fortress, the same. Uh, experience has built an unshakable faith in David through his personal adversity in life. You see, if, if a lot of people think, well, once I get saved, I'm not going to have any adversity in life. No, God uses the adversity that comes at us. Yeah, look out, here comes the adversity that comes at us to build our faith. And he also is, it creates a, an opportunity to witness to other people that we trust God to carry us through and deliver us out of this predicament. And, and we know we can. And the more we come out on the other side, like for instance, Rob being healed from leukemia, it's 14 months later, not one leukemia cell in his blood work. I, I just want to praise God for that. And I'm saying that the strength and faith that's built in this kind of adversity has has been forged in the fire yeah you can see yeah. uh you can see second corinthians chapter one verses three four and five coming alive and what this discussion that sylvia is giving us god comforts us so that we can be, be comforted, comforted and, and then 
we can go comfort others. others. And then the other topic about the names of God, well, what a great study that is because there's so many names of God. Why? It's because God will meet us at whatever need that we have. That's where he will meet us. And he is the God of that need. Um, who else has a comment or a question on the first 17 verses? 16 verses. Go ahead, uh, Nancy. Sylvia, I didn't get seven names out of your list. What was the complete list? Uh, I didn't read seven names, but Rob said seven names, so I took him at his word. Uh oh. All right, so let's okay, go back let's to that back. verse. Um, let me find it real quick. Um, oh, there's Adonai. No, no, just give me a second. I'll find it. I got lots of notes here. Um, Okay. Here it is, verse number verse number uh, two, uh, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, um, my, my shield, shield, my, my horn, horn of, of salvation, salvation, my stronghold. My stronghold. How many is that? Did I miscount? That sounds like seven. Um, just seven. Got an eye rock. All right, fortress. I got lucky. I was able to count okay on okay, that good. deal. Good. All right, any other comments or questions? Did you see that one? I think it's in verse two or three, depending upon which version of the Bible you have. Sheila, if, uh, in the Tree of Life, it's verse three. In the others, I think it's verse two. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Can't hear you, honey. Daniel, we cannot hear you. Yeah, sorry. I was I had two mute buttons. Uh, the reason there's a difference in numbering is the Jews uh, started the first verse uh, uh, in your version. Rob is not considered verse one in our version. It's actually like an yeah, introduction. That, it's a title or a subtitle. Right. Uh, they they call it a verse. There's a reason for it. Um, which is a whole study in itself. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to mention that there was going to be a difference in the uh, in the numbering system. And, and also and the, the Psalms, the, they have a lot of instructions to musicians too, because a lot of it is set to music. Yeah, so um, uh, as Dan is saying very clearly, the subtitle uh in the hebrew is counted as a verse yeah, yeah. thank you for that and then the, the other com the other comment is one of the seven uh uh attributes uh, horn of my salvation is quoted in uh luke chapter one uh zechariah you remember zechariah was the uh one of the priests in the temple and he uh he uh basically couldn't speak uh uh, God basically couldn't, wouldn't allow him to speak. But then once he regained his voice after John the Baptist was born, he uh, he had a prophecy. Uh, so starting chapter one, verse 67, his father Zechariah was filled with the Ruach Kokodesh and prophesied saying, blessed be Adonai, God of Israel, for he has looked after his people and brought them redemption. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ages past. And that, that horn, uh, uh, one of the commentators was, uh, is, uh, is a sign of strength. Uh, uh, can be used as a sign of strength, that Hebrew word. Gotcha. And that horn of salvation is also used in the temple and on the Ark of the Covenant, that horn of salvation is a power, the power of God to save. Okay, so that's a huge, that's a huge point there. Appreciate that. Good job, Dan. Thank you. Toby, you have more? Okay, yeah. Uh, prayer, prayer activates the throne of God. I think it's worth noting. Uh, remember, God is waiting for us to pray about issues. He wants us to apply our faith because we know that He is able and He is greater than anything we face. So he's looking for us to pray about everything. And a healthy prayer life is a sign of strong faith and a good relationship with God. Also, I wanted to mention that uh, in verse 12, the canopy is sometimes it was 
translated canopy, but it's it, it's a sukkah. Okay. Yeah, in fact, in the uh, Tree of Life version, it it has the word sukkah there, which is uh Reference. is like a chuppah. So it's a canopy. It's a tent. It's like the it's like the, it's a tabernacle. In, in the feast of of tabernacles. In the, in the feast of tabernacles, it represents intimacy with God. Yeah, or okay. fellowship or intimacy. Anything else? Yeah, actually, yeah. David praised him even before he was delivered. God gives us every gives us life and every breath, okay? So he is worthy to be, to be praised. There's plenty. I mean, we say, well, if God doesn't give us what we're praying for, well, guess what? God, God's given us way more than we could ever hope or think. Okay. Yeah, so we've shared this with this group before more than one time, but it's a good time to remind you. We have dear friends down in Florida who are part of our Bible study when we lived down there for a couple of years. Uh, uh, the 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 wife uh, prayed for her husband, prayed to God, thanked God for a loving husband, a godly husband, a godly man, and she always talked about it that way. Even when, before he was. When he was out womanizing and drugging and, and drunk, drinking. drinking, she would pray and thank God for a godly okay. husband you and see and all her friends would pray and, with and him and you're she, talking about she him. <laughs> believed it and boy i'll tell you what he did he became one, he became one uh, uh from the prayers and the belief and he's one of the greatest street ministries in broward county florida That's he's right. a great man so uh prayer activates the throne of god and if you don't have a lot of uh godly stuff going on in your life you might want to examine your prayer life who else has a comment before we move on to the next verse thank you Sylvia, go ahead okay so david reflects on how faithful god has been to him in this passage the day that the lord delivered david from all his enemies is the subtitle majority of all this is recorded in second samuel 22 and as you know as you recall when god wants to emphasize something he will repeat it uh how god helped david from the storms of life is what's what's being discussed here and uh david wills himself to love and prioritize his relationship with god despite being chased around and 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 fearing, well, I mean, having to run for his life. So we should choose to respond correctly, not based on the situation or emotion, but based on our the Lord's biblical command to love and serve God. So as I was saying last week, how then shall we live? You think about it, okay? K. Arthur points this out all the time. When you read the word of God, you have to go and reflect, say la and decide how then shall we live based on the word of god yeah and and just to bring out sylvia's favorite verse in romans chapter eight there are two conditions to having all things come together for good the one condition is to love god and the other condition is to live your life called according to his purpose and it fits right in with this discussion tonight all right uh sheila if you would unmute uh in uh your version it's verse 18 in the other versions it's verse 17 just the one verse for the moment he saved me, he saved me. from my powerful enemy from those who hated me for they were much stronger than me so this phrase who is much stronger than me is something which some christians will take an entire lifetime to learn. David understood that there were things in life which were bigger than him. And when he came up against those things which were bigger than him, he took that event up in prayer to the Lord. One of the reasons that David was so experienced in this area of deliverance is because he quickly picked up this idea that these things these challenges were bigger than him and so he would immediately give it up to god 
and go to the Lord in prayer. So if, if uh, I'll get to that, yep, yeah. If you read some statistics about uh, the habits of American people, our country right now and for the last many decades, welcome Roger Hershey Hello, from Roger. Virginia. Our country is spending more money on mood altering drugs than we're spending on antibiotics. Mm. We spend more money to put our children and our grandchildren on prescription drugs, which will alter their behavior, than we spend fighting bacterial infections. One out of every 10 women are on antidepressants, uh, and the number of, chi uh, 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 of children uh, uh, has more than tripled in the last 15 or so years, and this can be the very a very sensitive issue to discuss. I'm sure that we have friends and family. There might be people on this uh, Bible study that uh, are on prescription medication, but what we must recognize is that prescri prescription drugs does not fix the problem. It, it doesn't change anything. It just is, a, is more of a, a distraction or a mask uh, to mellow people out, uh, it masks your feeling. We're talking about depression here. It masks feelings. Uh, but here's the point. Uh, if there was anybody in history uh, that needed a prescription drug, it was likely going to be David because this guy uh, had, you know, was probably a bona fide bipolar personality. He had. He could be on the highest of high and three seconds later be on the lowest of low and fall into depression. Um, he was the subject uh, of, of, of massive emotional changes uh, and he was abandoned by many of his closest friends. Uh, in fact, he, his own children tried to kill him. I mean, imagine, you know, you have kids that might get angry at you, but you imagine what you feel like if, if your children were, you know, putting a posse together to come and murder you, okay? If there was ever a man who needed, who was a candidate to be on prescription drugs, it would have had to have been David. And David gives, gives all of this up to God in prayer. You know, ask yourself this question in the quietness of your own hearts. Uh, can God change us? Can God change you? Uh, that is the issue. God can take whatever is wrong in your life, and God can take whatever is wrong in your environment, and God can change it. God can change the entire world. He created the world. He certainly can change it or correct things. Uh, and so if God can change the world, then give it to God in prayer. Let God deal with the circumstances of your life rather than perhaps a prescription drug. David was a man who cried out to God. He said, uh, he says, God has delivered me. We are to, to take God at his word. Uh, I feel depressed. I feel down and out. My circumstances of life might be overwhelming. But God, even though I feel this way, I know you are able. I know you can help. So help me, God. Help me, Lord. And, and begin to believe that God will change your world and your circumstances through prayer. All right, we're gonna continue now. Uh, let's get back to Sheila. Sheila, read uh, in, your, in your version, it's verse 19 and the rest it's verse 18. Uh, read maybe another three verses and then Dan, if you would continue on for a few verses. They came against me in my day of calamity. But Adonai was my support. He brought me out to a wide open place. He rescued me since he delighted in me. Adonai rewarded.
rewarded me for my righteousness, for the cleanness of my hands, he repaid me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not acted wickedly against my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. Go ahead, a couple more. I was also blameless with him, and I kept myself from my wrongdoing. Therefore, the Lord has repaid me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyes, with the faithful you you. Show yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Roger, could you unmute and read verses, uh, I think in your version, 25, 26, and 27, please? Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. You have saved the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. Yeah, thank you. So as a rule, um, God, uh, God is to us, uh what we are to other people david is saying i was merciful to people and when you look at the life of david we can see that he was merciful to a fault uh he was likely uh too merciful but uh, uh according to our human nature he gave some of his sons far more mercy than he should have given uh he showed a tremendous amount of mercy uh to the household of saul and so david is pointing out that god has blessed david because david was treating other people with mercy all right uh you know fran i think i shortchanged you a minute ago uh would you read uh the next three verses which i think are going to be in your book 28 29 and 30. Okay, for, for you light my lamp, the Lord my God illumines my darkness, for by you I can run upon a truth, and by my God I can leap over a wall. One more. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tied, tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For God- Thank you, so, thank you. <laughs> Can, so what was it that, that made David so great? What was it that made him such a great man of of worship he lived a lifetime of heartache there was a lot of pain which he experienced in his life he was a fugitive for goodness sakes for over 10 years living in caves and constantly on the move uh, he was an enemy of the state uh when saul was uh, the king he was uh he was being lied about he was being betrayed uh, and that was after God, after God promised him that he would be king. He got that message through the prophet uh, Samuel. He, 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 uh, he lost a son in infancy. He lost a number of adult children. And so David going through life's experiences, uh, he 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 understood heartache, uh, and there is likely nothing that you nor I could experience in our lives that David did not experience in some fashion. But notice, after living this kind of a life, what is David's testimony about God? David says, "God." your way is perfect you do all things god 
it is really easy to praise God in America where most of us live in the lap of luxury. Most of us live in, in a, 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 a lifestyle that is far, far exceeding most of the rest of the world. It's easy in these conditions uh, to, to say God does all things and God is perfect. Now try putting yourself in David's Harachi sandals uh, and being able to say God is perfect. There is likely no greater hour in a person's life than after experiencing uh, the law, a loss in life uh, and be able to look heavenly or heavenward and say to God, God, you're good. God, you're great. You're, you're perfect. This is when we are allowing God to be God. Most of the time, our human nature does not allow God to be the Lord over our lives. But when tragedy and challenges are, are sent our way, we want to be our own God. That's human nature. We want to be the master of our own destiny, but that person who truly loves God will allow God to rule over them uh, and to worship God, not because of what God might have done for us in the past, but because God is perfect. Who is God? He is perfect. All right, we'll pause for a couple minutes. Who's got a comment or a question on the first 30 verses? Sylvia's hand is up. Okay, so God made us. He can heal us. <laughs> okay, healing is easy compared to speaking the universe into existence out of no raw materials. So uh, he can heal us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. David prayed and trusted God, deliver him, and God did. Adonai rewarded David for his righteousness. The Lord blessed him for his obedience. And uh, and Roger, what happens <laughs> then? What is that? What happens then? Blessing always follows obedience, right? Okay. <laughs> but uh, the Lord blessed him for his obedience. And it, it brought to mind uh, the line in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Uh, God is blessing David because he treated others with mercy. Uh, the Lord is a shield to all who take refuge in Amen. him. Amen. Who else has a good a comment or a question on the first 30 or 31 verses? I think God can do amazing things. Amen. Yeah. We have faith and believe it might not be his will for whatever we pray for, but it just might be. So we have to have faith to believe he will answer it according to his will. Amen. And trust him with his will, because you know what? We think we know the right answer. So many people pray and say, Lord, make this happen. And and I prayed for a husband for a few decades. Oh, make this one be the one. <laughs> but, you know, I had a lot of work to be I done on you. me before I came up to that to, to be worthy of that. I'm sure glad he didn't he didn't <laughs> answer my prayers. I was asking you. I was saying then, but thy will be done. And sure enough, he made me wait till I was 52 years old. But guess what? Wait a minute. You said you were 39. Oh, 39. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, we need to trust God enough to ask him for his will to be done and know that it's the best for us. Amen. Yeah. Who else has a comment or a question? Go ahead, Howard. I'm sure that David must have had some questions when he was anointed to be the next king of anticipating it might be in next year or two years, but instead of what, 20 years that he was- It was a long time, wasn't long it? Time. I mean, he, was a fugitive. he was a fugitive for 10 years or 10 or 12 years. Oh. Uh, yeah, it took quite a 
while before he became king. I agree. So you're saying he probably had some questions. When is that going to happen, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, did you well, wait so long? I'm trying to obey here, but it looks like that, that was not, not going to happen. <laughs> to be king. Yeah. Well, everything, everything happens in God's timing. We as human beings want it to happen right away, but sometimes, you know, if uh, we have to just wait till God aligns things. Howard, while you have the floor, will you read verses 31 to 34, nice and loud? For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps me my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand up on the heights, stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. He battled his arms, or my arms can bend a bow of bronze. More? One more. You make your savings help my shield and your right hand sustain me. You, your help has made me great. Yeah, thank you. So David understood that he attained greatness because of the gentleness of God. You have to remember that David came from being an absolute nobody. Uh, he was rejected by his brothers. His dad did not even think that David uh, was worthy enough uh, to come into the house to meet the prophet Samuel. Uh, uh, he had the lowest job in his family, uh, herding and looking after the sheep. And then he became one of the greatest kings among God's people. So how did that happen? It was not because uh, David took some kind of a Dale Carnegie course, okay? It's that, that's not the reason why. It wasn't because he had uh, some kind of an aggressive five-year a plan put together, uh, but rather he became great because God dealt with David through God's gentleness. Uh, it was God's gentleness which made David great. Think about <clears throat> how God has dealt with you in your life. If, if God gave you and me what we really deserve, I can only speak for myself, but I would be more than toast, okay? I would be ashes. I would be ashes in the wind, okay? If God really gave me what I deserve. Uh, and yet, when we look back over each of our own lives, has not God dealt with each of us with a great deal of gentleness? And hasn't God delivered us? And hasn't God managed our spiritual maturity. All right. Um, Arnie and Helen, would you unmute and read verses 36 to 48, please? I'll start. You gave a wide lit place for me, for my steps under me, and my feet did not sl slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them and did not turn back till they were consum consumed. I thrust them through through so that they were not able to rise they fell under my feet for you re equipped me with strength for the battle you made those who rise against me sink under me Go ahead. 40. just 40. no keep going 40. you made me you made my enemies turn their backs in flight and i destroyed my foes they cried for help but there was no one to save them to to the lord but he did not answer. One more. I beat them as fine as windblown dust. I trampled them like mud on, in the streets. Thank you, you have, uh, Nancy. Thank good? you. Yeah. So, thank, yeah, that's Nancy, good. thank you. Nancy, would you read the next few verses? Okay. Tell me when to stop. You have delivered me from the start strivings of the people. 
You have made me the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me. The foreigners submit to me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up from those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will Thank give you. Thank you. Thank you. So this praise in these verses gets a little bit into prophecy here, don't you think? Notice that he uses a couple of different terms. He uses the people in the Old Testament. That is typically referred to or referenced as, as Israel. He also speaks of the nations. Uh, that's typically a reference to the foreigners or the Gentiles. Uh, and notice that King David is saying the foreigners, the Gentiles, that's the representation, are going to follow me. Uh, and the people of Israel are going to reject me. When you study the life of David, I, I, I get chills thinking about this, how quickly the nation of Israel turned on him. David was the greatest king in Israel's history, and he took them to the, the very highest uh, zenith of, of the, their military power. He ushered in prosperity. Uh, and security like never before. And, and whenever the people had an opportunity to rebel, they would turn on David. Uh, and, and so, uh, in fact, when you look at the, the security detail, you know, in other words, those, those soldiers that protect the king, that are around the king and protect him, most of those were from the Isle of Crete. They were foreigners, they were Gentiles, who were who? Uh, they were Cretans. They were they were uh, uh, they they were they were Gentiles who were loyal to David. Uh, those men stayed loyal to him for most uh, 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 were mostly made up of Gentiles. You know, so the prophecy I was mentioning. You think about Jesus, the son of David. You know, through the line of David, Jesus came to his own. And his own received him not. And where does he turn? He turns to the Gentiles. And now he is taking a bride for himself among all of the people. David is saying, my own people will not follow me, but the foreigners will. Uh, so he's being prophetic here. Uh, he's giving us a little, a little foresight of what was going to happen with uh, the Messiah, uh, Jesus. When David's descendant, Jesus, comes, they will reject him, and the Gentiles are going to flock to him. And isn't that exactly what's been going on for the last 2,000-plus years? Um, Joyce, would you unmute and read the last two verses, please? Maybe it's one verse or two verses. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. So David's proper response is to offer thanksgiving to the Lord uh, for God working in his life. If you go back to the subtitle at the beginning of this chapter, it talks about David being delivered out of the hands of all of his enemies. Uh, then he also says being delivered out of the hand of Saul. Isn't it interesting that um, all of the enemies that David had in his lifetime, he fought off the bear, he fought off the lion, he, uh, he fought off Goliath, uh, or defeated Goliath. Uh, all of these forces listed against him, and yet the only one that he names by name is Saul. He mentions by name in these verses. He, he was delivered from the hands of Saul. God physically delivered David from Saul. Saul was not able to kill 
David. It is also likely that God delivered David from what a lot of people would call the Saul syndrome. The Saul syndrome. Think about who Saul was. Saul came up to uh, to the throne very humble. Uh, he was he was even a bit embarrassed uh, to get out of, out in front of people and into the public uh, when they wanted uh, to coronate him as the king. Uh, he resisted being famous. He wanted to hide out. But once he took over the throne, he took power. There was something insidious which took place uh, and took a hold of him. Uh, and we're told that 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 pride is of the devil. Pride comes before destruction. Uh, uh, that is what happens. Uh, that happened to Satan. And and there seems to be the same thing here going on with King Saul. He had pride. The pride gripped his heart, and it took him to his demise. When David says to God, "You have delivered me from all my enemies, even Saul," we would also have to say God was faithful to deliver David from the Saul syndrome. In other words. That means God delivered David from having pride. David took the throne. David ruled over other people. And yet he went through his entire lifetime remaining humble. It was the Lord who brought about this humility uh, in the mindset of David. And Saul let the power go to his head. Uh, the pride let him do things. Uh, that were incredibly ungodly, and it led to Saul's destruction. The difference between false Christianity and genuine Christianity is that is that false Christianity leads people to self-sufficiency, and genuine Christianity leads people to God's sufficiency. And what we see in David is he knew that his sufficiency was not in himself, but rather was in God. David's sufficiency was in God. We need to look and we need to examine our own lives and the quietness of our own hearts. And we need to make certain that we are relying on the sufficiency of God and that we're putting, uh, that we're not putting our efforts into self-sufficiency. When things go wrong in life, we are to cry out to God, we're to pray to God, we're to rely on who God already is, we're to rely on God's sufficiency, and when things go well in your life, we also are to cry out to God, to pray to God, to praise God, and to rely on God's sufficiency. All right, who's got a comment or a question about any of the verses in Psalm chapter 18? Arnie's first. I know you thought I wouldn't have any comments tonight, but not to disappoint. <laughs> uh, I didn't let me down. Yeah, you know, uh, if you look at verse 49, it's interesting. Paul repeated that verse word for word in Romans 15, verse 9. Word for word, he referred to this psalm. And, you know, if you think about it, this psalm could almost fit into Jesus' ministry. If you look at verses four and uh, four, five, and six, it's basically talking about like what Jesus was going through before he knew he was going to die on the cross. And then if you look down at uh, verses 20 through 24, it almost resembles the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, it's amazing the correlation between this Psalm of David and what could have been part of the ministry of Jesus. Yeah, well, in David's entire lifetime was an incredible part of uh, Jesus's ministry because Jesus chose David and his line to come through. And there's a lot of prophecy. There's a lot of foreshadowing. Thank you, Arne. Uh, Sylvia's got something to build on that before we take the next right, comment. To build on Arne's comment, David prophesied of his descendant, Jesus. 
uh, who, who came to his own, Israel. He was rejected by his own. And he turned to the Gentiles who followed him. Okay, This was messianic prophecy right there. And, and you'll see David saying, Lord, my Lord. Uh, you know, and it's, it's kind of interesting because it goes back and forth in time. But God knew all this all along. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he knew that the prophecy would come through David about his own descendant, Jesus. Good job. So, and, and I thought it was also interesting about the Saul syndrome, the, the sin of pride. You know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when some very well-meaning people come into power, sometimes they sometimes they actually get corrupted by that power. Uh, so we need to guard against that. Um, it's shown in the life of Saul. However, David was humble on the other hand. False Christianity leads people to self-sufficiency and true Christianity leads us to sufficiency in the Lord where it belongs. So we can rely on him, we can trust him, and we certainly can't trust ourselves when it comes to that anything. It's much better to rely on the Lord in everything and in prayer and supplication. Come to him and he will work things out in your life. It's, it's the better way to do it. So we need to praise him for that. We can rely on him every day. So does anybody else have uh, anything about these verses? Okay, Carrie, go ahead, unmute. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that's very enlightening. Um, I was, I'm thinking, I was sitting here thinking, why did David have to suffer so? He had been, he didn't go seeking the throne to be king. He was tended to his business with the sheep. But he, David was the called of God God chose David to be king. Saul, on the other hand, was pretty much um, somebody the people wanted. Well, first of all, Samuel um, lamented because the people decided they wanted a king over the judges. And God, and when it happened and Saul was first chosen, God already told them what was going to happen and your king is going to end up, um, I mean, your king, Saul, is going to end up taking your paying, uh, charging you taxes, uh, making slaves and blah, blah, blah. So David was chosen of God, yet he suffered so much as I'm reading this. He suffered because of Saul, who the people insisted they wanted a king, and yet Saul did not look to God and trust God, as has already been said, as David did. David was chosen of God, and Saul, uh, he went into battles. He didn't pray. Uh, he, he made the sacrifice when Samuel told him to wait seven days until I come, which is how he lost the throne. So he was told David's going to be king. And then because of that, he became jealous of David. And that's why David, I think, has all these enemies because um, of all that history that had happened. And David suffered because of what had already happened before he ever came about because David did not go seeking the throne. But it was God's choice, and it was in the plan of God the whole time. But in all the suffering that David went through, he trusted God. It also purified him into gold that he became the greatest king in the history. Mm -hmm. Good and job. also to build on what Terry is saying, how long was David a fugitive? Okay, so he was a teen when he was anointed uh, that he would be king. And he was 30 when he was crowned king. So uh, it was at least uh, 15 to 20 years likely that he was on the run 
running for his life from Saul who was trying to kill him. But you know, this other thing that I wanted to point out was the one passage that talks about, uh, and, and, and Fran will enjoy this because we used to sing this all the time. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and may the God of my salvation be exalted. So I love that part. I love that part. Yeah. Wonderful. While you're thinking about it, if you have any other comments, uh, I want to just mention to you that um, that this Thursday uh, we will be uh, studying Colossians chapter four, verses two through six. I know, Arnie. You know, how can you go five verses for an hour and a half? Uh, we'll probably run out of time for these five verses, but there's lots to be uh, uh, learned and discerned from those five verses. Also, I'll mention to you that uh, we, this Thursday and next Thursday will be the last two studies in the book of Colossians. And uh, then uh, the next Thursday after, so two weeks from this Thursday, we will begin the study in the book of Ephesians. So if you know friends who love Ephesians, now's the time to invite them so they can start with us when we start. And I'll just bring up again a, a great hearty thank you to Howard and Fran who gave me and Sylvia a Bible when we were down in Florida. That was a chronological Bible, which led us to uh, decide to study uh, Paul's letters in chronological in order. order. Yes. Uh, so again, always thank you for oh. the wonderful generosity from oh. Howard and Fran. And uh, um, this coming Monday, a week from tonight, we will be studying Psalms chapters 19, 20, and 21. Uh, 20 and 21 are rather short, but we'll cover all three chapters uh, next uh, Monday night. Who has a comment or a question about anything we studied tonight? I think, yeah, the, main ahead, thing, I think the main thing that he's trying to get across is to be faithful and to be patient. Be and faithful and patient. Yeah, and the trust in the Lord that he will do whatever is best for us, whether it's what we want or not. Good job. Good job. Thank Fran. you, Fran. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, so uh, following up on that same theme, so in, in verse 19, David says that God rescued me because he delighted in me. In verse 21, David gives one of the reasons that God delights in, in him uh, by saying, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. And the ways of the Lord, he, uh, he gives some of the ways of the Lord in verse 22, for all his ordinances were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. So those words, ordinances and statutes, if you go and look in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse 11, it says, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. And verse uh, Deuteronomy 8 uh, is the verse, uh, is the chapter that Jesus used to rebuke Satan. Uh, so I'll start in verse 1, but he rebukes, uh, he, it's in verse 3, you'll see it. Verse 1, all the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you, he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you had did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word, everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God showed David grace. Uh, grace is, uh, is something that we, we need because we're sinners. 
Uh, Psalm 18.15 says, He gives great deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Exodus 20, verse 6. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for doing that. And it's it's just so important to see how every book in the Bible, whether it's Old or New Testament, fits together like a, a very a very tightly woven tapestry. Yes. Yeah. Multicolored. Yeah, and um, uh, if, if you're somebody watching this uh, video uh, later on, a recording of this Bible study, and you would like to give your life to the Lord to have eternal salvation, uh, all you need to do is believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and just express a very simple prayer out loud with your mouth. And if you do that, God will open up his arms to you and accept you and his family. Uh, there's no better time to do this than right now. Uh, don't wait. We don't know how many more tomorrows we have. And this is an eternal decision that will, that will, uh, will stay with you obviously forever. So if you wanna give your life to the Lord, all you do is believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and say this prayer. You can use the, the pause button and say this out loud. Sylvia, what does that prayer sound like? Okay, let us pray. Lord Jesus, I confess my sins and ask for your forgiveness. Please come into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Take complete control of my life and help me to walk through your Holy Spirit in your footsteps daily in your power thank you lord for saving me and for answering my prayer in the power of yeshua hamashiach jesus our messiah and in cooperation with the holy spirit amen 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 and yeshua of course is jesus', jesus is hebrew messiah. name and mashiach is messiah that will one who saves if you said that prayer we congratulate you and encourage you to continue studying the bible either in our classes or in your uh, local church. Who's got a comment or a question or a takeaway uh, from any of the verses in Psalm 18 that we studied tonight? Okay, so. You covered it well. We, I, I did we, want to point out one thing that I had. I'll go ahead, Daniel. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, so I was trying to, trying to find it, and I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I think the uh, the kings of Israel uh, weren't they supposed to read the the Torah to the people like once every seven years or the Levites every once every seven years? I don't know. I'll have to look that That's up. Your <laughs> I know that uh, there were uh, there were kings in the history uh, when. Um, uh, they came into power and they had essentially tossed aside the Torah uh, that one of the kings, I forget who it is, read the Torah and recognized where the country had gotten off of uh, their tracks and he reinstituted following the Torah. Uh, but I don't know the answer to your question. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's actually Deuteronomy chapter 31 uh starting in verse 9 and Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests the sons of Levi and that bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord and unto all the elders of Israel and Moses commanded them saying at the end of every 7 years in the set time of the year of release in the feast of tabernacles when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose Thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gotcha. It was King Josiah and the 16th king of Judah, according to the Hebrew Bible, who inst instituted major religious reforms by removing official worship of gods other than Yahweh. 
So that was 648 BC, died 609 BC. Yeah, and so uh, during the festivals, they were to read uh, uh, the Jewish liturgy, which included the uh, the Torah. Uh, you can actually find uh, an example of that in uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter eight and verse two. Uh, of course, it was the it was on it was before Tabernacles. It was uh, fifty uh, fifty. No, that's not right. Um, it was um, it was the first day of the seventh month, so it was, it was uh, Yom Teruah, yeah. followed ten days by Yom Kippur, followed by Tabernacles on the fifteenth. So two weeks before uh, that festival, they would spend weeks there to cover the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles. And you can see that as an example in Nehemiah chapter eight and verse two, where it says they came from all different tongues, but they understood each other because they were reading the Torah. Yeah, Josiah during, during the uh, the celebration of those festivals. Right, Josiah is credited by most biblical scholars as having established or compiled important Hebrew scriptures during the Deuteronomic Deuteronomic reform which probably occurred during his rule. Yeah, well, that's something. Well, yeah. Okay. Good job. That's a, uh, Thank you for bringing that up, Dan. Anybody else have any comments? If not, we'll go ahead and close in a prayer and uh, and, and uh, we can finish a few minutes early. Yeah. Anybody? Nancy lost her connection. That's fine. Yeah. Um, fair enough. Okay, who would like to volunteer to close this in a prayer? Okay, All right, Arne, Arne thank you. Blessing. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Rob and Sylvia and their work so hard week after week to prepare these lessons for us. We hope that we pray that you heard our prayers at the beginning of this class, and we're thankful for all the participants and their comments. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Arnie. Now